following is a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about them, Cowboys? Yeah! Let's go, baby! Are you ready for a break? Uh, yes. Are you ready for a break? Absolutely. Ready for a break? Yeah, and um, so much for that. It's time for The Break on DallasCowboys.com. We were on a break! With Nick Eatman, David Hellman, Ambar Garcia, and Derek Eagleton. It is Thursday, December 17th, 2020, season 16, episode number 82. Welcome to the latest edition of The Break, presented by GEICO. Got my crew in studio with me here from the SWBC Mortgage Studios. Nick back with us. Happy to have him Thank back. Thank you. And- <laughs> Amber's here at studio. We got Dave remote today. Maybe at some point Dave will decide to join us. We'll see how that goes. Uh, we'll have Bucky joining us in just a little bit. He'll give us our breakdown of the uh, of the. Uh, I'm sorry. The what are we playing? San Francisco. <laughs> San Francisco's defense versus the Cowboys' offense. Before we do that, That's though, we promising. do need to catch up. I know. We do need to catch up, though, on some injury updates. Uh, Dave, why don't you catch us up on the entire secondary? Like, what's happening with them as far as injuries are concerned? We might have some DBs playing in this game. All right. Maybe. We'll see. Mike Mike McCarthy loves to say, like, he's like, today's the big day. Today's the day we'll find out. And then, like, tomorrow we'll be like, all right, yesterday was the big day, so how do they look? And he'll be like, ah, we'll make those determinations over the weekend. <laughs> Just classic football coach stuff. But uh, he did – I mean, he said he was very impressed by the work that Donovan Wilson and um, Anthony Brown were able to do specifically. Cheeto – practice yesterday as well so i mean i like the odds that two of those guys if not all three of them play on sunday which i mean you can roll your eyes if you want to i know the team is four and nine but we really haven't seen this team play with a full complement of starters in the secondary all year you know cheeto missed a lot of time ab's been in and out of the lineup oh i'm I'm an idiot trayvon diggs Diggs also practiced and looked good i'm sorry yeah these guys have not all been available at the same time throughout the season. So it's kind of exciting to think that they might all be able to, to play together for, for at least a, you know, a couple games here. So I'm hopeful that they can all get on the field on Sunday. I'll ask you that question, Nick. If Let's assume all four of them are back. How much of a difference do you think that makes for this defense? Or, or are we just mincing? Like it, it really doesn't matter a well, ton because you don't think that they're all that great. I don't know. Well, well both. I mean, because – you know, they went into this thinking that we can get a lot of pass rush. Our defensive backs are going to be solid at best. These four guys, Diggs and, and Cheeto and Jordan Lewis and Anthony Brown. So no one was thinking that these four were going to be like Hall of Famers anyway or Pro Bowlers even at that. So then when they all kind of go down, I mean, they have, they've said they've not played one game together. Those four haven't. Wow. Not once. That's and, amazing. And I still don't know if they'll play this one, you know, because I think they'll look at it and go, well, if we get him back, we don't have to rush this guy or vice versa. So, but yeah, I think it, it makes a difference because they were hoping to be average, and they never they didn't get that. So, yeah. what do you think, Amber? I think you know what's funny is lately I've been getting a lot of fans on Twitter getting mad at me. Some that are happy, some that are mad, just because apparently I'm not a diehard Cowboys fan and I'm over here talking about what I actually see with my eyes, but. Good news is for those fans, I mean, this is something good because if the Cowboys do somehow find themselves into the playoffs, then you're going to have some of these guys in the secondary to be available by then. So if you're looking for something pos- positive and a lot of hope, that, that that's something good. But if it's me personally, I just don't, I, I'm with that. doesn't really matter at this point. I'm just wanting to see some of these younger guys being able to play and take advantage of that time. Guys like Cheeto, it, I mean, unfortunately for him, his time is running out. You know, these free agent guys are, are really really needing to put something out there on film. Their time is running out. So I hope that, that guys like him are able to get back on the field and, and put up some stuff that could add, hopefully in two games help them to put something good out there to find the team or even if the Cowboys are wanting to send them back. Who yeah. knows? You know, it's interesting in a in a season of mainly disappointments, particularly on the defensive side of the ball. You got two guys right there that have been a part of the bright spots, at least uh, the few bright spots that you've seen in Donovan Wilson and uh, and Trayvon Diggs. So 
I'm excited to see them back on the field because I want to see if they can keep developing. And if maybe, just maybe, you may have found two members of an, of an ongoing secondary that may be a better in the future because, again, the, some of the best plays that have happened this year for this defense have come from those two players, and they're young. And so you haven't even been able to say that in quite a while when you talk about the secondary for the Cowboys. So that, I think, is very positive. Dave, uh, talk to us about Zeke Elliott. What's the deal on him? I heard he's, he still did not – I don't think he practiced here or he was limited. Yeah, he was limited, and McCarthy said he's going to continue to be limited. Um, just talking to – I mean, it just again, Mike McCarthy it hates giving out any type of details one way or the other. But just talking to Zeke, it's, it kind of sounds like the same thing as last week, which is to say they're going to limit him, and he's – you know, I would guess he's going to be questionable tomorrow when the final report comes out. But I get the feeling like he's going to play um, just from talking to him. You know, Zeke was the one yesterday. He was like, he was like, I'm a competitor. I don't, I don't care about any of that other stuff. I want to go. I want to get on the field and try to win every game that I'm involved in. So, yeah, I mean, they're going to be very. It sounds like they're being very cautious with his workload at practice. But I, I think he'll play. Okay, Nick, I'll, I'll ask you this question. We asked though, these guys the question yesterday, but I'd love to get your opinion on it. Tyler Biotish returned last week. He only played six snaps. They were all on special teams. Do you think that at some point you could expect that he's going to be moving back into the starting role as the center? or And going beyond that question, do you think he should be uh, the guy that they should insert into the starting lineup in, in place of, of Joe Looney? I do. I think that they should. I mean, you know, I, I I think you play the best players right now. You know, with any kind of chance you have to maybe win and get to the playoffs. But if um, but if it's if it's close, if it's a tiebreaker, and I don't really know if there's a difference between Joe Looney and, and Tyler Biotis right now. I, I I think Joe's better, I, but just because I would think that being in the league for that long w- would make you better. But um, I, I think you got to see what you have in, in Biotis as well, because you know. You're going to get to a point next year where you have to decide: is he is he the guy we're going to lean on here? And I think he needs to get some of these games. So if it's close like this one, then I would probably go towards the younger guy. All right, we're going to take a quick early break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to be joined by Bucky Brooks of NFL Network. He's going to talk us through the San Francisco defense versus the Cowboys offense. We got lots of questions that will roll his way. We'll do that when we come right back. This is DallasCowboys.com Radio. There's nothing as unique as our eyes, which is why Essilor pioneers ways to make lenses as unique as you. Verilux for super sharp vision, Essential Blue for protection, and Crizol for freedom from glare. Three cutting edge solutions in a single unique lens. So whatever your needs, insist on Essilor. Visit your local Essilor experts and find the perfect lens for you. See more, do more, Essilor. Since 1865, Stetson hats are American-made with pride right here in Texas. And Stetson is proud to be on the field with America's team. Want to show your Texas and team pride, too? You can. By purchasing your own Stetson, you can look just like how the flag guys do on field at every home game. Stetson hats, the official crown of all self-respecting Cowboys and your favorite football team. Get yours today at shop.dallascowboys.com or at stetson.com. I'm Jay Novacek, former tight end for the Dallas Cowboys. Back in the day, I was the guy who always got the tough yards, and that's why I run with John Deere today. In fact, I have a John Deere 3025E tractor that can handle any yard work I need to do, even the tough yards way out back. So if you have one acre or a thousand, John Deere has the equipment that's just right for you. Visit a John Deere dealer today and run with us. We are the official tractor provider of your Dallas Cowboys. Dear, it's 1908. Don't you think we should get electricity? Hmm, and stop using candles to see at night. It's just electricity lights up the room fast. It's more reliable than candles blowing out, and people seem to love it nationwide. Well, candles are... Dear, did you just run into the wall? Nope. May I have a new candle, please? Historically, switching to new technology is a no-brainer. Today, it's AT&T 5G. Fast, reliable, secure, and nationwide. Switch to AT&T 5G. It's not complicated. 5G requires compatible plan. May not be in your area. See att.com slash 5G for you for details. Back to the break. Find out why this year's Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders making the team is the most competitive yet. Don't miss new Hmm. episodes of Season 15 every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Central on CMT. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. All right, check it out. Season 15. 
15 seasons is a lot. That's I mean, a long that, time on TV. Really, really good programs out there that didn't go 15. That's what I'm saying. 15 so, years is a long time. All long. right. We're going to jump in. We got Bucky Brooks of NFL Network uh, joining us now, presented by Chevron with Techron. Bucky, we start where we start every time. Let's talk about the strengths and weaknesses of the San Francisco defense. Look, this team is, is talented, and even though they're without like their big guns, Nick Bosa, D. Ford, uh, a number of other injuries have prevented some of their top guys from playing. They're talented, and they play hard. And so when I think about Eric Armstead and Fred Warner and the intelligence of Richard Sherman and the reemergence of Justin Verrett, like, this is a very, very talented team. And what they do is, I mean, they, they play counter to the way that the Cowboys play. They're pretty simple in how they attack it. They believe that their guys are better than your guys, and they believe – over time that they're able to create pressure on you by being in the right spot down after down after down and that you will crack under the premise of having to play disciplined football. I may be exaggerating a little bit based on this past game because they actually ended up scoring two touchdowns, but is this a game where the Cowboys can actually score more than one touchdown? <laughs> I mean, it's tough. I mean, it's a really good scheme. Robert Sala has done a really good job of changing and adjusting on the fly. He used to be a guy who wanted to sit and cover three and maybe a little man free, but now they've evolved. They use a little quarters coverage, which is what Dallas plays. They really do a good job of basically throwing a blanket around your passing game and forcing you to nickel and dime the ball down the field. And they just believe the odds are in their favor that you will mess it up. And if they're able to generate any pressure at the line of scrimmage, well, then the ball comes out high and tips and overthrows lead to interceptions and so they just do a really good job for the cowboys it's about finding a way to protect up front and selectively taking your shots richard sherman and verrett both are not the players that he once were in their primes they're good but they still can be susceptible to getting got so can you selectively find your opportunities to push the ball down the field while also operating an efficient passing game and finding a way to run the ball enough with zeke to control the tempo of the game uh, Bucky, one of your uh, points this week on your on, on your five points a uh, five bucks article is uh, you think Tony Pollard is ready for the prime time. You said he's ready to take over. So you're looking at 49ers defense. What? How tough is it when you have a guy like Pollard and Zeke when you really have two true backs that you you have to game plan for? I mean, what what kind of challenges is that for defense? You know, depending on how they're deployed, you, you can create a, a bunch of different challenges. The one thing that we haven't seen, and they did it a little bit maybe a few weeks ago, putting Tony Pollard and Zeke on the field at the same time. Uh, the personnel alignment that I'm waiting to see would be 20 personnel, two backs, Tony Pollard, Zeke Elliott, three wide receivers, C.D. Lamb, Gallup, and Amari Cooper, and being able to challenge the defense in a different number of ways. If they continue to do what they've been doing, then I think it's enough giving Pollard enough snaps where he can impact the game without taking away from what Zeke needs to do. So if Zeke is going to get 20 touches, Pollard needs to get somewhere 6 to 8, 8 to 10, where he can impact the game. But it has to be a priority and it has to be scripted into the call sheet. I know that Fred Warner is a very good player, but can you give me a little bit more detail? Maybe just provide me with a snapshot of what he does for them and why he's so valuable? Well, he does everything that you want to see Jalen Smith do. He's instinctive. He reacts. He can fly sideline to sideline. He can make plays. He's tough. Um, he has a natural leadership ability to him that comes out in his play. Um, and I think when you look at him, he has emerged as one of the top linebackers. And as he goes, that defense goes. He controls the middle. And they just do a good job of just keeping it very simple for those guys so they play without clutter. And so you can see their talent on display. Hey, Bucky, uh, you look at the, the numbers for this defense. It bears out exactly what you're saying. They're very good. I think they're fifth overall defense, fifth in overall defense. But currently right now, they're fifth in pass defense. They're eighth in rush defense, both in top ten. Uh, that being considered, based on what Dallas does well, and you can decide for yourself what you think Dallas does well, how, are they, are, is Dallas more likely to be successful running the ball or passing the ball against a good defense that does both pretty well? Uh, I think it's a mix. I think this is a game, and I am the biggest proponent of, hey, you have to run the ball. But I think what you have to do with Andy Dalton, you have to throw on favorable down. So first and 10, quick rhythm passes. We've seen Dalton Schultz catch a ton of passes over the middle of the field, um, 8 to 10 yards. You have to 
put your offense in a position where you can stay ahead of the chain. So second and short, third and short situation, you want to stay out of those long yardage situations. So it may be a situation where you throw early so you can eventually run late. But a lot of it depends on Andy Dalton's ability to take care of the ball. Bucky, at this point of the season and, and with everything how this year has gone for the Cowboys, what would you say to a Cowboys fan to look for as far as excitement? What's something that Cowboys fans should be excited about in this game, whether it's on offense or on defense? Well, the excitement in this game, I would say, comes from the win or go home nature of the game. If the Cowboys are going to do it, <clears throat> you should see them play with more energy than we've seen them. As you get closer to the postseason, the urgency and the speed of the game picks up. So in my mind, if I'm a Cowboys fan and I'm looking for this game, if the Cowboys are going to have any chance of winning, the physicality should mirror what we saw in the Pittsburgh game. It should be the most physical game that we've seen because the urgency is if we don't win, the playoffs are out of question. So I think that has to be a part of it. I think you need to see the coach is really working together to make sure that all of the game plans complement one another and that they're doing everything in this game just to win the game. So it's about winning the game, not compiling stats. And whatever is necessary, you're willing to do. And so I would expect you to see not a level of desperation, but a level of urgency from everybody that's involved in this game. Buck, you just said Schultz has caught the ball over the middle a lot. Did they... Did the Cowboys lose anything this year with without Jarwin? I mean, 51 catches, 500 yards, three touchdowns. Is that what you thought Jarwin would be? Or do you think that they lost something because they didn't have two of those guys? No, I, I mean, I think he gave them the production that you would think. I think when you evaluate the tight end position in relation to the wide receivers, the pecking order should still be the three wide receivers before you get to whoever's playing tight end. Um, and so I think for Schultz to have 51 receptions, I think that is a very, very solid job. I think the interesting thing going forward will be how do they elect to use both tight ends um, 2021 and beyond? Do they utilize more 12 personnel, two tight end sets, and maybe one of the wide receivers, I would say maybe Michael Gallup finds his, his way on the sideline. Like, what is what is the plan of action? Do they have more versatility going forward? But I think Dalton Schultz has certainly been a nice surprise for the Cowboys. Bucky, I'm just I'm gonna step out on a limb and guess that Robert Sala is gonna fill a head coaching opening this offseason. That seems like a decent bet. And it's funny, you know, you mentioned that he kind of favors a cover three scheme. So, like, he completely reminds me of Chris Richard. then. Like, he's like this fiery players coach guy. Seems like he, you know, if he prefers that scheme, it's an even bigger similarity. Uh, you know, if, if he's the head coach of a team, I mean, what can I expect from that? I, You know, it seems like a good bet the Cowboys will have to deal with him at some point. What would you imagine his ideal blueprint for a defense and, and maybe a, a whole team would be if he gets one of those jobs? Well, I think the big thing, um, and much like Chris had to evolve down in Dallas, I think Robert this year has shown more adaptability and flexibility. I think before it was easy to say, oh, man, this guy, he has everything at his disposal. Look at all those first-rounders on the D-line, Nick Bowles and anybody. Anybody can close their eyes and generate a pass rush and play coverage behind it. This year he has shown the ability to be adaptable because they didn't have those guys, and people were eating up their scheme early in the year to cover three. And so they went to a more of a split safety Defense, And so I think as a head coach, that right there says you he has enough adaptability and flexibility to be able to change as necessary. The big thing when you get a defensive coordinator to be the head coach, who is going to be the offensive play caller? And can he have an offensive play caller that has what I say sticking power, meaning he can last for two or three years without being plucked by an owner who views him as the next head coaching candidate? That would be the thing. I think the key is who does he hire as an offensive coordinator? Because the defense will fall on his shoulders. What is his vision for how they play offense? But I do think they'll they'll be fast. They'll uh, be relentless. And I think there will be a little simple nature to what they do to a lot of players to play fast. We're joined by Bucky Brooks of NFL Network, presented by Chevron with Techron. One more question for you, Bucky. Uh, Buffalo, a couple weeks ago, were able to put up 368 pass yards against the San Francisco defense. What did they do that led to their success? And does Dallas have any of those components that they could then try to mirror some of those things uh, to have a similar amount of, of success? I mean, Brian Dayball was in his bag that day. He attacked them and attacked them relentlessly. He uh, 
did some things that he could attack their scheme. They went three by one and really caught them in some of their single high coverages. And they put the pressure on the safety in the middle of the field to make choices. And Josh Allen, with his arm, was able to really throw it over the top. And I'll say, I mean, Stephon Diggs is outstanding. But the wide, the wide receivers in Dallas, I would say, are still better. I think the big thing comes down to the trick man and can you protect. They were able to script some things that really exploited the coverage. And as I say, like with Verrett and Sherman, they're good, but they're still both susceptible to getting guys. So if the pass rush, rush doesn't get home, you can get those guys. It's just a matter of can you protect long enough to do double moves and long routes that you can spin Richard Sherman and Verrett around where you can expose some of the diminishing athleticism that they have. All right, so tell us what's going to happen. Who's going to win this game, and uh, what's your final on this one? Man, this is a tough one because anytime, anytime you can run the ball, um, this is tough. And so Cal Shanahan is going to run the ball, and he's going to attack them. And all the things that the Cowboys have put on tape in recent weeks, Baltimore and Washington, they will see those things at them. I don't have a lot of confidence that they're going to be able to solve those issues. And so I think it comes down to turnovers. And so the Cowboys have to create two or more turnovers. Nick Mullins has been very generous. It is the holiday season, so maybe he'll give some away. <laughs> but they have to find a way to make it Nick Mullins' game. They have to take the running game away. And that's a huge challenge for Mike Nolan and his defense. All right, Buck, we appreciate you joining us, man. We'll have you back next week. It'll be Christmas week, so we'll talk a little bit about those Philadelphia Eagles that'll be coming uh, coming around the bend that, that week. So let's go and take our final break. When we come back from this break, we'll talk a little bit more about this Dallas Cowboys offense. Then when we come right back, this is DallasCowboys.com radio. We're back with a tasty treat that's sweeping airwaves and taste buds. It's new Dr. Pepper and Cream Soda. Let's take a listen. Dr. Pepper and Cream Soda's here. A new combo that's music to my ears, okay. Let's play. Cream Soda and Dr. Pepper time. Pour it in a glass of ice. Ah, music to my ears and mouth. New Dr. Pepper and Cream Soda. A delicious duet. There's nothing as unique as our eyes, which is why Essilor pioneers ways to make lenses as unique as you. Verilux for super sharp vision, Essential Blue for protection, and Crizol for freedom from glare. Three cutting edge solutions in a single unique lens. So whatever your needs, insist on Essilor. Visit your local Essilor experts and find the perfect lens for you. See more, do more, Essilor. The Cowboys way, where 16 Hall of Famers and five championships shows us what success looks like. Where turkey is always the second best part of Thanksgiving Day. Where we are all defined by one single thing, the star. Where we as fans know it's our job to keep the tradition going. Bank of America is proud to be the official bank of the Dallas Cowboys and to support the quest of living life the Cowboys way. Copyright 2020, Bank of America Corporation. Dear, it's 1908. Don't you think we should get electricity? Hmm, and stop using candles to see at night. It's just electricity lights up the room fast. It's more reliable than candles blowing out, and people seem to love it nationwide. Well, candles are... Oh. Dear, did you just run into the wall? Nope. May I have a new candle, please? Historically, switching to new technology is a no-brainer. Today, it's AT&T 5G. Fast, reliable, secure, and nationwide. Switch to AT&T 5G. It's not complicated. 5G requires compatible plan. May not be in your area. See att.com slash 5G for you for details. Back to the break. If you can't go to AT&T Stadium this weekend, you can definitely bring the food to you. If you're craving the stadium's famous Cowboys cheese steak, nachos, Cowboy Rita, when you're watching the game at home, you can place your order online for pickup at AT&T Stadium every week this season. Check out the menu at at stadiumcom slash at home. Good stuff. All right, we're going to get this uh, final segment rolling. We are live from the SWBC Mortgage Studios at the Star. And uh, I want to have a couple questions for you guys about the Cowboys offense. Let's see where we go with these. Let's start first with the offensive line. We talked a little bit about them earlier this week, but I thought it was worth bringing this back up. They they allowed two sacks this, this past game against a Cincinnati team that really wasn't very good on defense. They also allowed uh, 100... Um, also, uh, only ran for 101 uh, yards. Were you disappointed? Because I, I got the impression after watching them for a couple games that this offensive line was seemingly getting better. 
Were you at all disappointed by their effort against Cincinnati or about their production against Cincinnati? Or do you think it still just kind of rides with what you thought about this offensive line? Let's start first with you, Nick. I think that the offensive line is, um, I've said this the other day, I think they're they're an athletic group. They're younger. I think when the whole field's in front of them, they're going to be pretty decent, especially against an average to you know to below average defense like that. But where they struggle is just they, they're not very strong. And, and when you get down in the red zone and you see that, then you think, oh, the offensive line didn't play as well. So, but that's my only really issue is th- with them is that I think that they're just not very good at pushing so people back. It didn't change anything about what you thought of them, what they did in this last game. Like, uh, if you were you a guy that was thinking their arrow was pointing up a little bit and it leveled off, or were you just thinking they were playing okay before that? Well, this is this is in my if I had to you know if I could. Pick the offensive line for next year. I mean, this would be my backups. Yeah, I think right across so you, the board. So you think some of these guys have earned a place on this team? Maybe not, obviously not starters, but they've earned a place on this team based upon how they've played. I mean, the, I think I think this is your second team offensive line next mm-hmm. year, or maybe. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen with Connor Williams. That one's kind of yeah. tricky. But other than that, I mean, the, these these guys could be backups. So you, you're going to feel better about. Oh well, if if Terrence Steele's your fourth tackle, you're probably going to feel better about it than obviously if he starts. All right, Amber. The only problem with that is that you really, really don't know and cannot predict what Lyle Collins' situation is going to be. Tyron Smith, Zach Martin. I mean, I think we went into this year thinking that we were pretty good at the O-line and pretty set and, and comfortable with the backups and the depth at the position just in uh, in the O-line in general. And then look what happened. So that that's my problem with that whole thinking is – you. <laughs> There's no certainty with these guys. And as much as they're great and everything, the starter I'm talking about, you cannot predict if they're going to be healthy or not. And when it comes down to that and when you're looking to win games, when you're looking to get a touchdown, passing the red zone, helping the the running game, Ezekiel Elliott, we see how much that has affected Ezekiel Elliott, which is a big, big element in this offense. So... I think that that yeah, they're still going to need help there uh, as far as some backup guys that can actually go in there with some power. I do think that these guys, they've, I mean, they've been thrown out there, and, and it's not their fault. It, it's just kind of what happened, and they're going to grow, but it takes time to grow and get that strength. We've seen that with Connor Williams. Connor Williams is still kind of battling there, so you just never know how, how long it's going to take for one of these linemen to progress into what you're looking for. So as of right now, to answer your question, I do think that they're just what I expected at this point. You know, it, it's one of those games that, you know, I, I'm not expecting them to do much, but at the same time, I I didn't come out of the game thinking, man, this O-line, what that was the problem. That's why the Cowboys play it this way or that way. So uh, I, at this point, it's just kind of what, what I expect personally. All right, Dave. I I was confused at the way you framed the question. To be honest, I mean, I I thought they played great. Like, and, and again, I mean, again, like for what they are, yeah. Like Nick said, like there's not a guy other than Connor Williams. There's not a guy on this line that you would prefer to be starting for you next year. So I keep that in the back of my mind in everything that they do. They let Andy, you know, I, like they kept him upright for the most part. He was able to spread the ball around. The offense scored 23 points. No, like they're not explosive or awesome, but they're not. I mean, how could you expect them to be? They're all backups. I, I mean, other than like Joe Looney is the one I'm not sure of because, you know, he needs a new contract and, you know, maybe the, maybe he gets it. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. Um, but I tend to expect all of these guys to be in camp next year. And I mean that's a good sign, and, and I want them to be like I, I, they've all earned an opportunity to make the fifty-three next year. I think even even Terrence Steele, because yeah, I'm totally fine with him being my fourth offensive tackle. Not I don't want him to start, but you need a you know you need a, so all these guys I hope are in camp next year, and and I hope that Tyron Smith and Lyle Collins are healthy, and that's you know those are topics for the off season. But I feel good about where they are for who they are. All right. Um, Let's move on. Let's talk about Zeke Elliott. 
And I, I was actually, I saw this on the on the website. There was a mailbag question I thought was pretty interesting. They were talking about some of the reasons why Zeke's production may have gone down. And so what I did was I have four things here that I've listed as reasons why Zeke's production might have gone down. And I want each of you guys to rank them uh, from the thing that you think is the biggest reason all the way down to the thing that's the least reason. Here are the things. You've got the offensive line injuries. You've got opponents focusing on stopping the run with Dak being out, so basically Dak being out. Um, third, you've got they've been playing from behind quite a bit this year. And then fourth, simply that Zeke's declined as a runner. Let's start first with you, Amber. Oh, man. <laughs> I have a short-term memory. I should have written those <laughs> okay. down. Offensive line. I think – I think that would be my number one okay. because I've seen the power that Zeke has. I think he has the – if regardless of Dak not being there, which is a huge element in the offense as well, but I still think that Zeke has that power. We just haven't been able to see it because maybe the O-line hasn't been uh, able to help him. So that would be my number one. And then – You the opponents uh, focusing on stopping it with Dak being Number out. two would be that one for okay. me. Okay, and then playing from behind – and then Zeke not just being as good? Um, uh, I think Zeke not being as good would be number three for me, and then playing from, from behind would be number four. I think that um, him losing the ball so many times, I mean, that's on him. You mm -hmm. cannot blame that on anyone else but him. That's his hands and his own doing, basically. But um, also maybe the, the way that... Kellen Moore has been utilizing him, maybe not giving him enough opportunities, but maybe that's just an effect of him losing the ball so many times and them maybe losing somewhat some confidence in him. Uh, but that would be my ranking. All right. Dave. Oh, I, I mean, he doesn't have his quarterback, and I think that's that's the big part of it. And I mean, I know the offensive line has been banged up, but – I think anybody who follows the Cowboys closely is probably aware that, you know, the narrative of this great wall of Dallas has been more myth than reality over the last, you know, two or three years. You know, they haven't been this elite unit that just bulldozes everybody since probably 2016. So, yeah, it would help to have those guys. But this is this is a quarterback league. And if you like if, if the defense isn't afraid of your quarterback, they're going to key on the next best weapon, which is Zeke. I have his stats right in front of me with Dak Prescott. I know the team wasn't good or, you know, they were eight and eight mediocre. But with Dak Prescott in the lineup last year, Zeke ran for thirteen hundred yards and 12 touchdowns. He averaged four and a half yards per carry. Uh, and he had what I'm, I'm he had like seven or eight hundred yard games. He's got one this year. Uh, and, you know, some of that is a byproduct of they were out of games early when Dak was still in the lineup. But I'm confident that wouldn't have held up like those turnover problems wouldn't have held up throughout the whole season. They would have had a chance to lean on some teams the way that they did against Cincinnati and Minnesota. And I just think I think it's hard when you don't have a quarterback that scares defenses. So I chalk most of it up to not having Dak. OK, so that's your first one. Where, the, where do you rank the other three? Oh, well, uh, no Dak, no offensive line. Zeke's and Zeke's decline in that order. And I, I answered. It was me that answered that question on the mailbag. Yeah. I think they're all three val. They're all three valid questions. Um, and and I mean, I, I don't think Zeke is as explosive or dynamic as he was earlier in his career. He's got a lot of tread on his tires. But and I've said this more times than I can count on this show. Like when he's got Dak and a healthier offensive line, I think he'll be just fine. Like yeah. I am not worried about him in the long run. He's it, just fighting through a crappy season. And it's actually amazing that when you look at that, that you say he's relying on on Z. I mean, on Dak being here because the narrative has always been since he got here that Dak mm -hmm. is reliant on Zeke. And I think what we're starting to see now is maybe the flip of that, where maybe having Dak is just as important, if not more important, to Zeke being able to do well, as opposed to the flip. Nick. Well, well oh, good. Sorry. I, Dak, I'm, go ahead, because I, I have a point to that. Okay. All right. I, I was just going to ask, in that point, I mean, back then, were defenses as scared of Dak earlier in his years? No, They're probably not. not. They probably weren't not. this year. I mean, like, if you think about it, even this year. They they still were keying on, on Zeke. I mean, 
That's why, look at all the the yards that they racked up against Cleveland, against Seattle. I mean, even, they still wouldn't let. I mean, the, the focus was always on Zeke, even this year. And that's why well, but, but Dak was able to take advantage of it way, way more. Well, but I don't, I don't know if I agree with that because there were a lot of those games with those yards and, and the, all that mass production came when they were way behind, in which case defenses were playing back. Like, they weren't necessarily at that point in the game going up and trying to stop the running game. So they, they were both, trying to stop. So they both sucked until the end. Yeah, maybe. I okay. mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, maybe. maybe that's the answer. I, my point is, I just don't know that it was – I don't know that te- – now, I, I do think teams probably went into games saying there, there's probably not been a team the Cowboys have played over the last four years that didn't go in the game and first priority was we got to stop the run. Right. But, by the way, that's most NFL games, right? But I do think that there, there were a lot of games when they were keying on the pass by the time – that Dak got going, and Dak was still going. Yeah. You know, uh, often I mean the quarterback would be number one for me, just because any team that plays four quarterbacks in a season is probably going to have a bad year. And so that's because yeah. we we saw the offensive line was good in fourteen, terrible in fifteen because they didn't have any quarterback, mm-hmm. and then back to good again in sixteen when they had a better quarterback. So I would say quarterback, offensive line, uh, playing from behind, those things kind of all trickle together, and then seeks decline would be the last one for me. And that's interesting because none of you guys had Zeke decline any higher than third. Um, and I think there are questions that people are bringing up right now. So do you guys think those questions are invalid when you start talking about Zeke? Do you think Zeke is still the same runner that he was three years ago? No, I don't think he's the same runner that he was, but I think the difference between where he was three years ago and now is not as great as the difference of, of Zach Martin and Connor McGovern and Terrence Steele and mm-hmm. and you know and Lyle Collins. I think that drop off is way more way greater than his own drop off. Dave, what do you think? I just want to. I mean, back to the other point, like. It's not wild to think that that's changed. Like, Dak Prescott is a much better quarterback in 2020 than he was in 2017. Like, he has developed as a player. So it's not like this crazy shift. It's like, oh, the most important player on your team has gotten a lot better over the last three years. I mean, it makes sense. Um, And, I mean, Zeke has has declined. That's what running backs do. It's It's like driving a car off the lot. Like, the minute you take it off the lot, it loses value and it doesn't gain it back ever. Like every carry declines your value by a little bit. Um, and I don't think it's severe. I still think he's a talented running back, but the proof is in the pudding. He's, he can't, you know, he ain't Barry Sanders. He can't do it without some help. He just, I mean, he can't or else he would be in my opinion. Yep. Uh, and I don't, I mean, I don't want that to sound too harsh. And that's what I keep saying is for the pro- for the price they're paying for him, you would like to see, that dynamic ability that makes him dangerous without a better supporting cast. But there's no evidence to suggest that that's true. Amber. I I mean, I agree with what he said. I think that what we're seeing this year is just realizing that Zeke maybe is a guy that needs the help around him. And you you talked about Dak. Yes, obviously that's going to be a completely different weapon than the other quarterbacks that they've had. And obviously the O-line, we've seen that. And I, I... but regardless of that, I still think that Zeke has it in him. And I think he he will be better next year, but he needs those other guys around him. And that that's maybe what we're real, realizing this year. Yeah, I think if you go back and remember where the Cowboys were when they made the decision to draft him as high as they did, he was supposed to be the cherry on top of a great offensive line. Like they, I don't think if they didn't have that offensive line at that time, I don't think they select Zeke Elliott with that pick. I think they probably go Jalen Ramsey or that quarterback with a veteran quarterback. Right, right. Yeah. I, I just think that I just think mm. that there was a whole different set of circumstances that. And by the way, those circumstances aren't here this year, right? And you don't have that offensive line. You don't have that quarterback. And so to expect that Zeke is going to perform in the same way as what you were uh, as a it, same way, despite the circumstances being completely flipped, I think is a little bit unfair to Zeke uh, in some respects. All right. We're going to take a couple questions here, maybe one or two questions we can get to from fans. Amber, what you got? Well, I have a, a draft question uh, or as far as trades. Do you guys think, I mean, we've talked about the three wide receivers and, and how great they are and all the talent there. Do you guys see a possibility where the Cowboys decide to trade um, either Michael Gallup or Amari Cooper for something? I was a lot more I was a lot more opposed to it when the Cowboys still had something to play for this year. You know, I, I hated the idea in October 
you know, when you're thinking this team might have a chance to accomplish something. I still don't like it because I would rather have three really good receivers than than not. But, you know, Michael Gallup is now entering – I mean, he's basically entering a contract year. He's got three years left this season. Um, it would depend what you get for him, but if, if somebody wanted him in the off season and they would give me a high draft pick – I would consider it. I don't. I really. I don't. I. I, I would have. I'd be reluctant to to move Amari Cooper. And like he's got his haters. Like people want to hate on him. He's going to set career highs for catches and yards this year. And as Nick mentioned, when you start four quarterbacks, that usually means you're not having a good year and your offense is not going to be good. With the exception of the Ben DiNucci experiment, he's still producing at a pretty good click, even without his preferred quarterback. Um, He's a and, and like he's dynamic enough. To like he can have a 200 yard day where he scores two touchdowns, but he's also been a reliable possession guy where your quarterback can look to him for six, seven, eight catches and 80 yards on a reliable basis. I I think he's pretty underrated at this point. I would be reluctant to get rid of him, but if somebody offered me like a second or a third round pick for Michael Gallup, I might do it. Yeah, if I got more, if I got better value than what I drafted him in, I would think about it. The thing about Gallup is that he most when you have three really good receivers, you you that can be a problem because we know how we know what kind of players good receivers are, and but having three together could be an issue. Just listening to him the other day, it didn't sound like that's going to be a problem with him. And and I'll say this: that might be the reason why he's never really great. And I hate saying it that way, but the reason, you. Yeah. you know what I mean? Like he probably won't rock the boat that he's not getting the ball all the time because he even said that. Like you know, it is what it is. Some games you do, some games you don't. But that right there might be the one little thing holding him back that makes him not like an elite, elite player yeah. because he doesn't have that drive. That be- no, 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 I don't want to say that. It just doesn't seem like he's too worried about it, and and that's okay. I mean, it's okay that they want to be three guys together, you know, and then that. That could be pretty dangerous. So I'm going to play a devil's advocate because I was actually having this. I was actually thinking about this yesterday. It, have you seen in the NFL a team do really well? A team get deep in the playoffs? A team go to Super Bowl? Maybe a team win it that had this much talent at wide receiver? Because with every really talented guy you got at one position, that's one less talented guy you may have at another position, yeah. right? And it made me start thinking, is is this team becoming the Atlanta Falcons, where they've got really great receivers, they got a pretty good trigger man, but their defense, not very good. Uh, and, and as time goes on, it just starts wearing on other things because you're putting so much into that. Do you, do you think that this is the wrong strategy, maybe? Not saying anything about the players themselves. I know we all want those three players to yeah. be here. But strategically, is it the right move to have that much talent at wide receiver versus taking at least one of those pieces and turning them into another player on another at another position where you could really use them? That's that's fair. That's fair because when they had them with Dak in the first five games, they were trying to outscore teams and they weren't. Right. You know, so you can you can make the argument. I mean, and and, I, and you know maybe that they could use a better cornerback or safety or whatever. So yeah, I mean that's fair. Dave, what do you think? I mean, I hate to compare Dak to one of the best two or three quarterbacks to ever play the sport, but 2013 Broncos were pretty nice. They had three wide receivers that were awesome and an awesome tight end. I mean, I, I, I think in a game with as small a sample size as football, for that matter, um, the Chiefs that just won the Super Bowl have a – I mean, Patrick Mahomes is incredible, but the guys catching the ball in Kansas City do not get remotely enough credit for how good they are. Uh, you know, Tyreek Hill, Kelsey, you know, even Sammy Watkins to a degree. The Cowboys wanted to pay Sammy Watkins a lot of money not that long ago. Um, so I, I, in a sport with this small of a sample size, I don't know that it's fair or right to just assume that there's only one way to do it. I absolutely think you could win a Super Bowl with the best receiver core in the game uh, putting up big numbers. I mean, you got to do something about your defense. You have to, but I mean, you can do that with the draft. The Cowboys could, you know, opt to spend some money to do that. Like that's <laughs> that troubles me way more than how many resources they commit to wide receiver is. I just I don't know in today's NFL if you can build a contender without spending money in free agency. Like yeah, but your cap's money. gonna is, um, is probably gonna go down this year though, right? I if, if not, completely understand that. Right? I, I mean, I, I totally get that. But 
I mean, okay, like let's just let's just play this out, and you trade Michael for a second round pick that's like somewhere in the sixties. Now let's think about the defenders that you can probably get in that range. And, you know, maybe you hit and they blossom into a great player, but the odds that they're going to become this incredible defender in the first year or two of their contract, that's not very realistic. I mean, think about what you got from Trayvon Diggs this season. Like, that's probably what you're getting for whatever you get for Michael Gallup. So, I mean, you're not getting you're not getting Ed Reed at pick 51 to come in and fix all your problems in the secondary. So it's the classic case of like, you know, Jerry loves to say, you know, you the, you got it, you know, the jello in your hand and it's squeezing out one end while you're trying to fix the other. Um, I, I mean, like I said, I'm not opposed to it, but I don't know that it's going to be this cure all. Yeah. And it might, there, there is no fast answer here. I think is the, the point, like you, you're, you're, you got what you got. And by the way, the Cowboys do have a ton of talent. Like they, if, if they had everybody healthy, you would think they would be a team that would be at least a playoff caliber team, if not more. Right. Um, but I don't think there's a quick fix to this defense. I think it's going to require some parts and I, I just don't know if they have enough with the resources they have right now in, in the draft and knowing that they're going to lose a lot of guys at free agency and knowing that the cap may go down. Like, all those things combined, I just don't know that there's a good fix right now other than getting more picks to be able to bring in more players. Yeah. Well, see, my argument to that would be uh, they absolutely need to draft defense. They need to address the defense. They, but, but that's the long game, you know? That's kind of like – that's like a major house renovation. And in the meantime, like, it's – it's still true. It didn't work this year because of injuries, but like their offense is going to be their best bet to win games in the short term. Yeah, fixing the defense is like a two or three year project, and the offense can help you get there while you're working on it. That's the way I view it. Although a good draft and some good picks and maybe a good free agent or two can get your defense to middle of the road. You get a middle of the road yeah. defense with a high powered offense. Now maybe you're working with something, That's right? All I need. Yeah, exactly. That's all all I right, need. we appreciate you guys joining us. We'll be back tomorrow. We're going to wrap this thing up, get you guys ready for this final uh final game uh, or not final game, but get you re- guys finally ready for the game on Sunday where the Cowboys will take on the San Francisco 49ers. Till then for Nick Eatman, Dave Helm, and Amber Garcia. I am Derek Eagleton. This has been the break live on DallasCowboys.com radio. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah!